All right. So it had to happen sometime. <laughs> Sorry, I am dog sitting my mother's dog, so he doesn't listen to me. But I'm going to go ahead and get this started, even though we uh, still have some people joining in. Um, and apologies in advance for any dog barking. But I'm going to start by reading our uh, moderator statement. So, welcome, everyone. Before the session starts, uh, I have a statement to read on behalf of the conference. The Open Education Southern Symposium, OESS, strives to offer an open, inclusive, and friendly environment for all participants. All attendees are expected to help maintain a professional and welcoming environment free of any type of harassment by being mindful of the space and time you are taking up, being aware of the dynamics of power and privilege, being considerate of others' desire for privacy, being respectful of others and accepting that differences in opinion and circumstances create a stronger collaborative environment, actively challenging individual biases and assumptions. Um, and I will also drop the link to the full code of conduct into the chat now. And with that, uh, Katie, you can get started. Great, thank you very much, Natalie. And thank you, uh, Laura and Stephanie for um, uh, all of your work on uh, organizing this, uh, this great symposium. Um, so, uh, th and thank you all uh, to those of you who have um, uh, uh, responded to um, the Mentimeter poll um, uh, about talking about your own experiences with um, you know, reflecting on your own OER experience and expertise. And I have to say, of the responses I see on the screen, nervous, chaos, learning on the job, never enough, excited. Um, I have experienced all of these things and sometimes many of them at the same time. Um, and so I hope that um, today what I can do is talk a little bit about my experience um, uh, running an OER program and experiencing some imposter syndrome and talk about what's worked for me. And I hope you know, you can talk about what has worked for you as well, because I think this is something let some or all of us have experienced at uh, some point. So let's hopefully go into present mode. There we go. So um, I this presentation, you know more than you think you do, uh, overcoming OER imposter syndrome. And I'll explain um, uh, my thinking behind that title uh, in a little bit. Uh, it's nice to meet you. Um, I am Katie Beth Ryan. Um, I use she, her pronouns. On my campus, uh, my primary role is as reference and instruction librarian. Um, I am also coordinating our campus honors program. And as of a few months ago, I am coordinating an OER stipend program for our faculty. And I am at doing all of these things at Franklin Pierce University. Uh, the main campus is in Ringe, New Hampshire. I actually thought I might be the, the northernmost participant here today, but um, I, I, I'm actually not. And that's cool. It's nice to see people from, from all over. Um, so Franklin Pierce is a school of about 1,900 students total. Of those, about 1,200 are undergraduates. We also have health science campuses in Manchester and West Lebanon, New Hampshire, and as well as in Goodyear, Arizona. So we have, you know, quite the footprint in New Hampshire, and then we've um, also expanded our offerings to um, to the Southwest. So it's probably not going to come as a surprise. Uh, my personal interest in uh, imposter syndrome, you know, when you're dealing with OER, is based on personal experience. And I'll give you a little uh, background on how I got here. I've been involved in OER work, I would say, for give or take five years. Um, I completed an OER internship at Bay Path University. Um, I have uh, worked with individual faculty to identify OER with their courses. Um, you know, I've always, I've, I've had a hand in the OER work um, for a while, even if it hasn't been my primary role. Uh, this year um, at Franklin Pierce, I had the opportunity to expand the work that I do uh, by way of a digital learning grant 
uh, the university received from the Davis Educational Foundation. There was some money left over in that uh, grant that wasn't used. And uh, when I was approached by Paul Jenkins, who is my library director and um, the administrator of that grant on our campus, uh, asked me, uh, you know, what are your ideas for, um, uh, for increasing OER use on campus? And so I suggested this uh, stipend program. Um, I had uh, seen stipend programs um, at uh, Springfield Technical Community College, which is another place I did an internship and other universities and other schools as well. You know, this, I saw this as an opportunity to, again, uh, increase the OER footprint, get, get OER textbooks into classrooms. You know, I felt very confident that this was a way to do that. Um, and, and they liked that idea. And so we ran with it. Uh, not long after, <laughs> Uh, as, as, as I started to consider the scale of the project, the things that I would have to do, um, the expectations, I, I just had this, I am not qualified for this moment. What was I even thinking coming up with this? What were they thinking in allowing me to, uh, to do this? So, you know, I kind of recognize these as, you know, classic imposter syndrome, uh, 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 symptoms. Now, imposter syndrome, imposter phenomenon, these are two phrases that get thrown around a lot. And so I think it's important to first uh, define, diagnose uh, what they are um, or what imposter syndrome is. Uh, I think a, a lot of people are familiar with the original, what is considered the original um, uh, uh, study on imposter syndrome from Clance and Imes published back in 1978. Uh, which identified imposter syndrome among high achieving women. Uh, these women experienced, in spite of, you know, their, their many uh, accomplishments, experienced feelings of inadequacy, which manifested into anxiety, depression, um, an inability to meet their own um, uh, standards of achievement. Uh, does any of this sound familiar? Sound familiar? I, I know it certainly it, it, it rang true for me and based on some of the responses in the Mentimeter, I think it probably rings true for a lot of us. Now, I know this is, there are many different, um, uh, at this conference, uh, there are more than just librarians. I know that we have instructors, we have instructional designers. Um, so, you know, I, I, uh, there are many, many different disciplines in which imposter syndrome could be studied. I was interested in looking um, a little bit more into the, uh, the, the, my own field, which is the library and information science field. Uh, Clark Vardaman and Barba uh, uh, did a study of, uh, of librarians and their feelings um, uh, toward their work, found that uh, one in eight have very high feelings of imposter syndrome, and it tends to be most common um, among early career librarians, let's say people who are less than five years uh, into LIS work. Another reason that they identify is that uh, librarians often have fewer educational credentials than their faculty colleagues. Uh, very often uh, we have a master's degree rather than a PhD, which uh, can cause some feelings of um, superiority or uh, make us feel as though we are not experts in our work. Um, and then further, this is uh, very recently, uh, Emily Owens uh, did a study of uh, imposter syndrome amongst scholarly communication librarians and open educational resources usually fall under that, you know, scholarly communication umbrella. Uh, uh, found in her, in her work that um, uh, there were frequent instances of imposter syndrome among scholarly communication librarians in part because there is a high expectation of the expertise you have. Um, you know, uh, scholarly communication librarians have their hands in many pots. They um, are often doing institutional repository work, um, data science. Uh, 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 they have knowledge or are expected to have knowledge of the publishing cycle. And many of the respondents uh, in her study said that they simply have too many responsibilities, um, too many responsibilities, uh, too many things being asked of them 
uh, which contributes to their feeling that they are inadequate or they are not um, measuring up to um, the standards of the profession. So other OER imposter syndrome culprits, these are just a few that I've, I've kind of come up with on my own um, or have identified on my own. Uh, most of us are not copyright lawyers, <laughs> uh, believe it or not. Um, I found that uh, in my own um, uh, approach to OER work, some of my biggest questions had to do with um, copyright, what is and isn't legal. And uh, I, I, of course, I don't have a law degree. You know, I am not generally qualified to give people legal advice. And so when somebody comes to me with a copyright question that uh, uh, I, I, I'm not able to answer, I, I get very flustered. Um, additionally, OER is um, a young movement. Uh, there are always new things to learn and know. Um, uh, and there are always going to be things that we need to, uh, uh, to, to push ourselves to do uh, because it's ever evolving. And then in my own personal experience, and I'm sure people, uh, others have experienced this as well, there was a question of, am I the right person for this job? You know, I'm, I'm only a few years out of library school myself. I have not worked in the open realm very long. Am I really the right person to oversee this stipend program, to give advice to faculty, to, uh, to get textbooks, uh, open textbooks and open materials into classrooms, into the LMS? Um, and I think uh, many other people have experienced this as well. I do think that um, uh, it would be irresponsible though, when we're talking about imposter syndrome or these feelings of inadequacy, to not name the structures, the environments that contribute to these feelings of imposter syndrome. And to even call into question whether the issue lies with the individual or the system in which they are working. So in, in Emily Owens' study, uh, and uh, 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 several other studies have found as well that um, uh, uh, the respondents felt that the lack of experience was a reason for um, their feelings that they couldn't do the job. Um, and part of that is because, like I said in the previous slide, OER work is, is very young. Uh, and it's always growing, it's always evolving. There's always something new to learn. Uh, they have always, they also cited uh, training as, um, uh, as a possible reason why they are feeling like they are not up to the job. You know, it begs the question of either does your institution provide training opportunities or does it provide um, uh, chances for you to go and learn these skills um, elsewhere? And then time. I mean, I think in the last year, all of us have just felt stretched thin um, and uh, feeling like there is too much on our plate. Like we have too much uh, uh, being thrown at us at once. And it you know, begs the question of whether there is too much being asked of um, individual people and whether that contributes to their feelings of imposter syndrome. And I also think that we have to acknowledge the very real systems of oppression that exist, like racist, sexist, ableist, uh, heteronormative environments um, contribute to the feelings of isolation and inadequacy uh, that many people experience. Um, so when, whenever these feelings of, whenever, whenever these moments of feeling like a fraud come up, you know, we have to look at the system in which we are working. We have to, as McGee says, uh, look at the institutional factors, the policies and the practices, and really wonder whether we are getting the support uh, and uh, that we need in order to, um, to do our work well. Additionally, uh, I, there was a, another article I found from the um, the Harvard Business Review, uh, Stop Telling Women They Have um, Imposter Syndrome. Um, imposter syndrome, again, some, uh, you know, another criticism is that it puts the blame on the individuals or puts the onus for um, overcoming the situation on um, individuals without acknowledging what external factors may be at play. So um, it's important that we acknowledge these in any discussion of imposter syndrome or imposter phenomenon and how to, um, how to overcome it. 
Um, so next, I want to talk a little bit more about the side effects, which are probably uh, uh, well known to all of us. But um, why is it not letting me advance? There we go. So one of the things that Clance and Imes uh, uh, discussed in their um, uh, in their study were what they found was that some of their respondents who reported having feelings of uh, of imposter syndrome they had they it resulted in them having this vicious cycle of overcompensating like working too hard and then they would be you know complimented they would be praised for their hard work and that is what fed them or or what um, um, uh, kept them going um, but you know, I, I don't think it's a stretch to say that this this uh, cycle of overcompensating and trying to prove what you actually um, belong in the room uh, leads to burnout and, uh, uh, and 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 also self selecting out of OER opportunities. There were many moments um, when I was going through this uh, creation of the OER stipend where I just said, I'm not up for this. I, uh, you know, I've got too much on my plate. I need to step away. Um, and so this is why we need to, uh, why OER imposter syndrome, while it may not be recognized as, you know, an official, an, uh, an official um, symptom or an official malady or um, uh, uh, stumbling block, it's something that we need to um, acknowledge and something that we have to talk about as well uh, before we can you know, move past it. So treatment, ideas for how we overcome this. Uh, I will be honest with you, if you were coming here uh, looking for like one great panacea uh, uh, for how to overcome imposter syndrome, I'm sorry, I don't have it. I, all I can do is talk uh, a little bit about what, you know, the literature has said, but also talk about um, something that has been very helpful for me as um, I uh, have, have been going on this OER journey. Um, during the past five years, uh, when I've been doing a lot of OER work in tandem with that, uh, I became a parent for the first time. Uh, talk about imposter syndrome uh, when you are, you know, trying to uh, keep a newborn fed and to get them to sleep, to get them to, you know, you know, to, to take care of a, a very small, vulnerable human being. And uh, uh, Dr. Spock, who is a name familiar to a lot of people in, um, uh, if you've ever raised a child, his, uh, his guide to baby and child care uh, contains this quote, which is, you think, you know more than you think you do. That was very reassuring to me when I was a new parent, and it's very reassuring to me whenever I um, am uh, facing feelings of inadequacy. I have to remind myself that I do know more about um, copyright uh, law than um, uh, than a, a lot of people on my campus. I do know um, uh, I have knowledge of where to find uh, open uh, materials. Um, and I and I've done a little bit more of that than your average faculty member who may not have as much time uh, uh, to do so. So thank you, Dr. Spock. Additionally, um, uh, other things that you could try, and uh, we'll talk a little bit more maybe about what has uh, worked for other people, is education um, and educating yourself. Uh, uh, the Rake Straw uh, paper lists um, ideas like. Uh, participating in listservs, you know, contributing to listservs, watching webinars. I would say you're already doing this, right? You're here at a conference dedicated to open educational resources. Um, you, you're clearly invested in this work um, and you want to know more. And um, uh, so you're already on the right track. Uh, and, you know, I, I encourage you to keep going, I'm encouraging myself to keep going with that. Um, uh, th there was a, uh, a librarian, Ashley Faulkner, who um, uh, uh, wrote a piece a few years ago about um, encountering uh, 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 imposter phenomenon as a new librarian, and she talks about the role of mentorship and uh, what uh, it can, uh, how mentors can help you uh, identify where your strengths are, what you're doing really well, and uh, maybe even share instances of where they have experienced imposter syndrome. And advocacy. 
Um, I think, you know, if you can find, similar to mentorship, if you can find an advocate, find your people, find them and hold on to them and, uh, and communicate with them and work with them. And additionally, kind of going back to, um, uh, you know, structures that, uh, that may result in people feeling inadequate. If you're in a position of power at your institution, at your organization, you know, be an advocate, you know, always be on the lookout for what structures may be holding people back. And um, if you have the power to, um, uh, to advocate for others, you know, please do so. You know, that is, um, uh, it's very much appreciated by um, uh, the people who are maybe, maybe struggling a little bit and maybe wondering whether they do belong. But that's really all I have, I think. I don't think I have another slide. So um, yes, Natalie uh, let me know that I needed to transition to question time. Um, that was four minutes ago and she said you need to do it in the next two minutes. So hopefully we have time here for, um, for questions. Uh, I've also left my contact information up here, uh, my email address uh, where you can reach me on LinkedIn. But yes, I'm, I'm monitoring, I'm taking a quick look at the chat. Uh, yeah, the same could be said about fixing copyright law, isn't that, isn't that the truth? <laughs> but, you know, and, and, you know, this is maybe uh, uh, encouraging people to be a little vulnerable, you know, what have, um, what has worked for you um, in dealing with uh, the chaos or the feelings of uh, imposter syndrome that you may have faced? Um, uh, you know, either, either put it in the chat. Um, I don't know if can Keep, yeah, we're, we're, we're on a panel setting so people can't unmute, but um, yeah, I'm, I'm here, I'm looking. And if you have, and if anyone has questions for me too, you know, uh, feel free to, to let me know here or elsewhere. Where are people from? Where, where are people coming from today, by the way? If you wanna drop that in the chat, I always like to see where people are, are coming from and what they do. That's the beauty of, of the open movement. We are, we're coming from all over and we bring different perspectives. And yeah, Charlotte, my godfather lives in Charlotte. Natalie, Natalie's in Portland, Arkansas, Florida, North Carolina, Houston. Oh, that's great. Well, also thank you. Thank you for being here too. Um, some of us are on central time. I'm on Eastern time. So it's like 430 here. Uh, so I know when you, when you, whether you go to an in-person conference or whether you go to a, um, uh, a, a, a Zoom conference, like we have, you know, sometimes by 430 in the afternoon, you're just, you're just done. So I really appreciate you uh, making the effort to be here today. And I hope um, I, I was able to share some good insights with you. Uh, I'll stick around. Um, thanks, Ariana. Thanks, everyone. Yeah. Thanks so much, Katie. That was a great presentation. Um, and thank you, everyone, for attending. I am going to go ahead and close the session out. Um, and you can join us in five minutes at the next session. Take care. Thanks, Natalie. I'll stop sharing.